Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So I am back to talk about part four of Les Miserables. I think because this particular part is split into 15 chapters instead of eight, I'm probably gonna do five per vlog. It depends on how much I get done. But yes, this is the first vlog about part four, saint -Denis. And as I am currently meeting you, I have read books one and two. So let's play a little game. Let's just see if you are on the ball with Les Mis. So after the tension and the excitement of the end of book three, you would probably think that Victor Hugo might want to, you know, go back, pick up right where he left off. So the little quiz, the little test that I want to give to you is, do you think that that is what Victor Hugo does in the first book of this section? Here are your choices. A, he digs right back where we left off. B, he doesn't go back to the main plot, but he kind of just sidesteps into a sub plot that isn't the one that we left off but you know is still relevant to the plot or option c victor hugo starts off part four by going on a lengthy historical digression that has no basis in the plot what do you think he did what do you think he did if you guess C, you would be correct. Yeah, book one of part four starts off with a very, very lengthy digression about the revolutions of 1830 and 1831. And yes, they are kind of relevant, but they are long as well. I actually think when Kieran got to this part, he put on the Discord, yay, more history. <laughs> and I'm saying this as somebody who is obviously like a big history fan, but when it's only vaguely connected to the plot, you are just kind of like, Victor, what are you doing? I think there is some really interesting commentary in here. And I think something that really kind of appealed to me was the way that he was talking about how nations react after a time of great trauma. And I feel like something that we could actually apply to this time. He kind of talks about how after there are these big revolutions, these big rebellions, when there's been a massive upheaval, how often there is a lot of complacency after the fact that the lessons of these big revolutions often are not picked up upon for quite a while because people are just tired. At first, the nation wants nothing but rest. They are worn out. Every Everybody is asking for a bed. But because people aren't taking the time to actually implement the changes that are needed after these big upheavals, it means that things start reverting to back as they were before. Before there had been that big revolution, so what was the whole point? As weary men demand rest, new realities demand guarantees guarantees and new realities what rest is to men. And it kind of makes me think about the things that maybe we are being complacent about right now. It feels weird to kind of talk about going back to normal because we're not quite there yet, but when we do start to go back to normal, what are we going to do? What kind of changes are we going to implement? What lessons are we going to take? Are we actually going to make any sort of progress or are people going to be so fatigued, so exhausted about talking about COVID, about talking about lockdown, that things are just going to revert to how things were before the pandemic. It's not something novel to say that the pandemic has really highlighted the ways in which institutions really fall short, especially when it comes to income and healthcare and work. But are people just gonna get so excited by the idea of returning to normal that actually we don't learn anything? Are people just going to be so tired that they just want rest and they don't want to ensure that that change actually happens. I don't know. Towards the end of this book, we do start to revert back to the plot. And we see the friends of the ABC as they come together and talk about their strategy for revolution, talking about the different people that they're going to need to convince. We also get a little bit of a section where Paul Granter is being shot down once again by Enjolras. Enjolras wants somebody to go to the main toll gate to convince them of joining the rebellion. And he doesn't have a spare person to send to the main toll gate because Marius is absent without leave. And Granter stands up and he says, what about me? I'm here. You you? Yes, me. You? Rally Republicans, you? In defense of principles, fire up hearts that have grown cold? Why not? Are you capable of being good for something? I have the vague ambition to be, said Granter. You don't believe in anything. I believe in you. Which I remember from my days of Tumblr was the line that really got all the Enjolras Granter shippers hearts going. <laughs> but I feel like people forget that as soon as Granter says, I believe in you, that Enjolras just shoots him down. Granter, will you do me a favor? Anything. Polish your boots. Well, don't meddle in our affairs. Go and sleep off the effects of your absinthe. You're heartless, Enjolras. As if you'd be the man to send to the main gate. As if you were capable of it. Enjolras doesn't believe in Granta. And maybe he has good reason not to. <laughs> and then following on from that, we get to book two, Eponine, in which we find out what happened to the Thenardiers after they were arrested. A lot of the main criminal gang ended up escaping from prison alongside Eponine. And Eponine, who we can already see has got quite a bit of an obsession with Marius, finds him and lets poor downtrodden, dejected Marius know that she has the address for the young girl who Marius has been besotted with. And Marius is delighted and completely oblivious to the fact that Eponine has a bit of an obsession with him. And when he reaches out to give money for her trouble, she just looks at him, throws the money on the ground and says, I don't want your money, sir. And so right now I am at book three, the house in Rue Plumet. So what's going to happen? Is Marius going to get the courage to go see this young girl and find out her name? I don't know. Let's keep reading. Hi, everybody. So since we last spoke, I actually did some reading sprints over at Shannon from 155 Books channel. And in the like hour and a half to 
hours that we had to read, I ended up blasting through not one, not two, not even three, but four books of Les Mis. What is this productivity? Which means that I have the hard task of having to blast through the commentary of each of those books. So wish me luck that I'm going to be able to do this quickly. So first off, we have book three, The House in Rue Plumet. So I'm sure you've all worked it out by now, but yes, the girl that Marius was in love with was actually Cosette. And of course, her father was Jean Valjean. Victor Hugo decides to throw a little bit of shade at Thenardier with this explanation, saying, in the episode related earlier, the reader was probably even less slow than Thenardier to recognise Jean Valjean. And in this book, we are finding out basically what happened to Cosette and Jean Valjean after they left the convent. Despite the fact that Valjean had intended for Cosette to become a nun after her education, he decided that that was probably unfair, that he wasn't allowing Cosette the opportunity to really experience life to the fullest. And we get to see them basically set up home. And through this book, we're really seeing Jean Valjean's kindness come through, but also his self-sacrificing nature when it comes to Cosette. And also him not really thinking that he is worthy of any sort of attention or possessions or basically any good thing that happens to him, he doesn't think he's worthy. He's constantly putting himself down and giving himself lesser things whilst giving everything to Cosette. But what is also coming through in this section is Cosette's personality and her determination and her love for Jean Valjean. Cosette kind of picks up on the fact that Jean Valjean lives in lesser accommodation to her and that he eats the black bread rather than the white bread that he gives to Cosette. Father, it's very cold in here. Why don't you put in a carpet and a stove? My dear child, there are so many people who are more deserving than I am and who don't even have a roof over their heads. Then why do I have a fire and every other comfort? Because you're a woman and a child. Pah! So men must be cold and uncomfortable? Some men. Very well. I'll just have to come and see you so often you'll have to have a fire here too. And she also said to him, Father, why do you eat such nasty bread? Because, my daughter. Well, if you eat it, I'll eat it too. Then, so that Cosette should not have to eat black bread, Jean Valjean ate white bread. She's basically not allowing Jean Valjean to treat himself any less than he does her. And it's kind of sad because Jean Valjean doesn't really even register how much Cosette loves him. He doesn't truly know and appreciate just how unconditional her love is. So when Cosette becomes more beautiful, when she starts attracting attention, particularly of Marius, he starts to panic. He starts to grieve that she's not going to love him anymore, that she's going to up and leave him. And yes, Cosette, has recognised Marius's affection for her and she reciprocates. But also what we're seeing in this chapter is that Jean Valjean has recognised this interaction. Even though their interactions have been completely wordless, like the kids aren't being subtle, you're realising through this section just how much is happening in silence. We also see how after the episode with Thenardier, Cosette doesn't go to the Luxembourg Gardens anymore with Jean Valjean because she has to look after him. And as a result, Marius stops going to the Luxembourg Gardens himself. And when Cosette realises this, she becomes very depressed. I was saying during the live stream, the way that Victor Hugh Hugo describes this. It's it, it's very reminiscent of Bella in New Moon. You know the scene in New Moon where it circles around Bella and like the months of the year just flash by because she's doing nothing, she's just wallowing. She felt a heartache that nothing could relieve, which became more intense every day. She no longer knew whether it was winter or summer, sunshine or rain, and she remained despondent, lost to the world, mindful of one thing only, her eyes vague and staring like those of someone gazing in the dark at the pitch blackness into which an apparition has vanished. However, a sad incident between Jean Valjean and Cosette also happens in this book, in which instead of taking their normal afternoon walk to the Luxembourg Gardens, he takes her on an early morning walk. And during this walk, they end up seeing the convicts from the chain gang. And Valjean is kind of heartbroken when Cosette sees the men and she seems very frightened of them. Later on, she says, I think if I were ever to cross paths with one of those men, oh dear God, I'd die just from looking him in the face. Obviously what Cosette does not know is that she's standing right next to an ex-convict and it kind of reinforces to Jean Valjean that he's not a worthy person and that Cosette's love might be conditional, even though that is far from the case. We then move on to book four, which is help from below, maybe help from on high. This is just a short little chapter in which we are following Gavroche as he's searching around for food. He's very hungry. And on his travels, he comes across Monsieur Mabouf, who I haven't mentioned before, but who was married Maurice's old employer, and Gavroche witnesses Monsieur Leboeuf being mugged by Montparnasse, who was one of Thenardier's gang. But Monsieur Leboeuf, despite his age, does not go down without a fight, but his fight is verbal. He basically remonstrates Montparnasse, delivering this fantastic speech about how, even though Montparnasse thinks that he's taking the easy way out by being idle and by stealing, that actually his life of stealing is actually a much harder life, a much harder life than working. That because he shirks work, he's actually making life so much harder for himself. Montparnasse, obviously, 
actually takes the money anyway because he's no good. But Gavroche is really affected by this speech and kind of taking advantage of his youth and his little height, he ends up pickpocketing Montparnasse for the purse that he'd stolen and delivers it back to Monsieur Mother's house. So Victor Hugo is kind of giving us a commentary of how not all stealing is created equal. So like I say, this was just a short little book. So now on to book five titled, which does not end the way it began. <laughs> I do get the sense that Victor Hugo was running out of chapter names. And here we assume Cosette and Marius who were very very sad about their lack of love, about the fact that their love for each other has not been acknowledged and they don't even know the other's name. They're both pining for each other but Victor Hugo does go out of his way to point out that Cosette is able to bounce back a lot easier than Marius. Marius was the sort of person who becomes immersed in sorrow and settles into it. Cosette was one of those who sink into it and emerge from it. And he kind of makes it as a bit of a commentary on privilege, kind of insinuating that because Cosette has had a harder life, especially as a child, that she's able to bounce back a lot better than Marius. Marius, who is basically brought up with a silver spoon in his mouth, finds it really hard to emerge from his despondency, which we have kind of seen in previous books. Marius is definitely somebody who, when he becomes despondent, when he's depressed, tend to isolate himself and he kind of retreats into himself. And just generally in this particular section, we are getting much more of a sense of Cosette's personality, her lively her compassion, her lack of fear. Cosette thinks that she hears a noise in the garden and she goes out to investigate. However, despite this, she's not afraid. Besides, Cosette was by nature not very easily frightened. Remember, she was more of a lark than a dove. She was wild and brave at heart. And I just wanted to take a second to mention how different this is to the depiction of her often in the musical. And it's something that I will probably come back to is the fact that they really blended out Cosette's character for the musical. I feel like maybe because they wanted to kind of pit Eponine against Cosette. So Eponine was kind of given all of the personality and Cosette was given nothing. She was just kind of this beautiful blank slate that everybody falls in love with and nothing else. And yes, it does kind of depend on how actresses portray her. And like I've said before, like I think particularly Katie Hall was a fantastic Cosette and she really brought out a lot of Cosette's liveliness. But yeah, she's often not given a lot to do in the musical. And also over time, they've kind of cut a lot of her part out of the musical. A lot of the first cuts to the songs will be Cosette's lines. And I think that's such a shame because she is the, the face of the musical. She is the character around whom most of the other characters orbit. Her love and the love that other people have for her is what drives so much of Les Mis. That as much as I love the musical, it is a shame that they blended out her character. Anyway, that's maybe a rant for another time. And basically she goes out into the garden and she finds an envelope and inside we find out that Marius has found her house, her garden, and he has left on her seat a long 15 page manuscript letter professing his love to her. And can we just point out that if she didn't love him back this would have been so creepy because he's basically confessing that he's followed her, that he's basically been stalking her for the past few months. It's so creepy! But you know because that's in love with him too so she finds it fine. <laughs> and then she goes out the next night and Marius is in the garden. He's been waiting for her once again. So creepy! And he professes his love for her. She professes her love to him. They spend a few hours chatting about their lives, chatting about their aspirations, their wants, their hopes and dreams. And then only at the end of that chapter do they actually exchange names with each other and I just can't help but feel like this is a very backwards version of courtship. You know, they profess their love to each other, they kiss, they then have a conversation and start talking about their hopes and dreams and then only at the end do they exchange names. Hmm, I guess it works for them but I, I don't think I'll be trying that out myself. And then the final book I'll be talking about right now is book six, Young Gavroche. And in this section it was something that I'd kind of forgotten about. It is revealed to us that the Thenardiers actually had two more sons after Gavroche. But of course Madame Thenardier not wanting sons, she kicked them out when they were very young. Poor little baby. They do originally have a few years where they are looked after but then they are very quickly left out on the street. And Gavroche Gavroche comes across them and takes them around Paris trying to find food. In this section not much is happening in terms of plot but we're getting to see much more of Gavroche's character. We are getting to see how street smart he is, how in many ways he's old beyond his years out of necessity. And he's very very confident, like if I had just one tenth of Gavroche's confidence I feel like I'd be set up for life. Like I say he takes them to find food and eventually to find shelter in the elephant. And the elephant has caused quite a bit of controversy in the discord group. Kieran was like, elephant? What elephant? Uh, and this is the elephant of the Bastille, which I will insert a picture of here. But yeah, basically Gavroche and the two little boys sleep inside this elephant. This was something that I believe was taken down in the 1840s, but like, oh, 
I would so visit that today. <laughs> We're introduced to Gavroche's street slang, which is something that will come up in a later chapter. And then also towards the end of this book, we find out about Thenardier's escape plan. So it seems like Jean Valjean and Cosette are not going to be safe for long as Monsieur Thenardier has been broken out of prison. Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing well. So at the moment you catch me on my lunch break from work. I just thought this time would be a really great one to wrap up books seven and eight at Les Mis. Also, you might be a bit dubious of the fact that I'm wearing my dressing gown even though I'm working and yes, yes, I am doing that because I need it. I don't know what I've done in the last couple of days, but I've really messed up my upper back. So my hot water bottle has been my best friend in the last couple of days. Usually on a lunch break, I would go out for a little bit of a walk around the block, but I'm meant to be moving the first lot of my stuff down to my new place on Saturday and I don't want to push it. So no, just waiting for my soup to heat up. And whilst I'm doing that, I can chat about Les Mis. So book seven of part four Saint-Denis is an interesting one. <laughs> the book is called Slang and basically is Victor Hugo talking about the merits of slang. <laughs> what is slang? It is both a nation and its linguistic expression. It is thieving in its two guises, people and language. Fit Hugo is talking about why it's important that we study slang, that pretty much every profession has its own terminology, its own slang that it uses. So why do we study that, but we don't prioritize slang of everyday people? But the main point he keeps coming back to is that slang is the language spoken by misery. Slang is the language of wretchedness. And that that's probably why people don't study it because it is seen as the language of the poor. And that generally academics don't think that the poorer people in society are worthy of study or of concern and that's why they ignore it. It's definitely an interesting digression but I don't think it's my favourite. And though it's an interesting point, I do think out of the digressions of Lamers that I've read so far, this is not one of my favourites. It's not as bad as Convent. <laughs> but I feel like I got more out of stuff like Waterloo. And then we move swiftly on to book eight, Enchantment and Despair. And this is the last one that I'm going to be covering in this particular vlog. And we're back with the lovebirds, the dramatic courtship of Marius and Cosette, which is kind of further emphasized by the fact that Victor Hugo describes, Marius had finally entered Cosette's garden as Romeo entered Juliet's garden. <laughs> Basically detailing how every night for six weeks, Marius comes to Cosette's garden. Of course, after Jean Valjean and the maid Toussaint have gone to sleep. And you really get a sense of how much they have kind of idealized each other, romanticized each other in their heads. It seemed to Cosette that Marius wore a crown and to Marius that Cosette had a halo. But to an extent where at some points I'm questioning, is this a healthy obsession? <laughs> Hugo describes how Marius had a singing in his ears that made him deaf to any other thought. He existed only during the time he was seeing Cosette. He's completely blind to anything else that is going on around him. Loving almost replaces thinking love is an ardent forgetfulness of everything else. How that can be delightful, but also kind of bad. And Victor Hugo does not let us forget that there are things rumbling in the background. The, fr the friends of the ABC are planning their rebellion, but of course, Marius doesn't really care. Meanwhile, Thenardier has been plotting and he actually is able to find the address of Jean Valjean and along with his gang are planning on robbing them. However, Eponine, who, as we'd mentioned, had given Marius the address of Jean Valjean and Cosette, manages to quite impressively scare them away. However, Eponine does slip Jean Jean Valjean a note telling him that he must move house, which is enough to frighten him into doing so. So the next day, Cosette has to give Marius the very sad news that they are most likely going to be moving to England. And of course, Marius is heartbroken by this. His entire life is Cosette. He's completely obsessed by her. Once again, to a point where you're like, is this normal? At Cosette's side, he felt close to his own property, his chattel, his despotic ruler, and his slave. <laughs> That's not cute, Marius. And in fact, that particular line reminds me a lot of the line from The Taming of the Shrew. She is my my goods, my chattels, she is my house, my household stuff, my field, my barn, my horse, my ox, my ass, my anything. Of course, Marius is not going to treat Cosette as Petruchio treats Caterina, but I feel like the parallels are maybe deliberate. But terrified of the idea that he's going to end up losing Cosette, Marius does something he has not done for years and he goes to see his grandfather. And we see how Monsieur Guillemand has really suffered with the lack of Marius in his life. And he gets so excited when he sees Marius. However, we're also seeing how, once again, Monsieur Guillemand doesn't feel like he can show his love, he can't express his true feelings. So he puts on a bit of a show, this show of being tough and that he doesn't care about Marius. When Marius asks for permission to marry Cosette, he kind of turns him away and basically starts insulting Cosette and saying, why can't you just have her as your mistress? And of course this infuriates Marius. And it's only at the point where Marius leaves the building that Monsieur Guinamand realizes what he's done and realizes that Marius is probably not going to come back and he's devastated and heartbroken. And this concludes the end of book eight. As I've said before, this was going to be a slightly longer vlog because of the fact that there are 15 books within part four, but we're making our way through. I think I'm somewhere between two thirds to three quarters of the way through, which is very exciting. Do let me know how you're getting on with Les Mis. How have you been getting on with part for. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks.